How many have ever had a bad day? Let me see your hand. You've had a bad day? All right. Uh, how many have ever had a good day? Raise your hand. All right. Hopefully that everybody has had good days. Can we all admit that some days are better than others? Some days are better than others. I have had my share of good days. Uh, the day I got saved, that was a very, very good day. Uh, the day I met Kim, that was a very good day. Uh, the day I kissed her for the first time, that was an extremely good day, uh, for, for me at least. I don't know if it was for her. Uh, but uh, the day we got married, that was a good day. The day that our oldest daughter, Brittany, was born, that was a good day. The day that our son, Brandon, was born, that was a good day. The day that our surprise, our youngest daughter, Brooke, was born, that was a good day as well. Uh, the day we started Avalon Church, that was a good day. I'm so thankful that God allowed us to do that. Uh, the day that I saw a wild lion in Africa for the first time, that was a good day. That was a memorable day. I've had many, many good days. On the other hand, I've had some bad days. You have too. The day I got my finger cut off, I was just a little boy. Uh, that was not a good day. It was a bad day. Fell into a gigantic industrial fan on my grandpa's farm. Almost lost my life, but thank God for his grace and mercy. He saved me, rescued me from that. That was, a, that was not a very good day. Uh, when I was 13, riding a motorcycle, I got run over by a car. That was not a very good day. Some of you said that explains a lot about you, right? Uh, the day I found out about a missed opportunity. Have you ever had a missed opportunity? You, you ever have a day that at first you didn't think it was a bad day, but then you look back and you're like, oh, I missed that. I missed that. In 2011, I had a, a, a friend of mine ask me, literally beg me. He said, you need to buy this particular product. And I didn't understand what it was. I didn't know what it was. He said, you need to buy this. He said, put $1,000 into it. I'm like, how about no? Because uh, I didn't understand what it was. And I put that $1,000 towards something else. At the time, you could get one of these things for $1. I checked it last week. One of these things today is worth $64,000. Had I bought $1,000 worth of Bitcoin in 2011, I would have had $64 million, um, and uh, I would be on a beach somewhere. You guys would not see me. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. Uh, but the fact is, when I found out about that, that was a bad day. I missed an opportunity. You ever miss an opportunity like that? I'm not sure that any of us uh, knew something like that, but hindsight's always 2020, isn't it? Uh, not a good day for me when I figured out that I missed out on that. The point is this. We all have good days. We all have bad days. And there is something in Scripture that will show us that even during our worst days, how we can turn those to good, how we can celebrate even those days of the good things that God has done in our life. We're going to read something today that was written by King David. If you don't know who David was, maybe you're not uh, very familiar with church or with the Bible. David was the one that killed Goliath. You've heard of David and Goliath. He became the king of Israel. And uh, there were some very, very good days in the life of David. The day he killed Goliath, that was a great day. Um, the day he was anointed king as just a teenage boy. That was a great day in his life, I imagine. Uh, there were many great days. I'm sure the days that he got married and had kids, these were great days in his life. But he also had some bad days. He was familiar with bad days. There were days that you and I would not want to suffer through that David went through. For example, after he had been anointed king, King Saul, who was king at the time, tried to kill him. That was a bad day. He lost his best friend, Jonathan. That was a bad day. His own son, Absalom, tried to kill him. You think you've had family drama? Maybe you had an argument over Thanksgiving and got mad at a relative. They probably did not go to the extent that Absalom did. He not only deposed his father as king, he literally tried to kill him. The day that his 
son, one of his sons, tried to rape or did rape one of his daughters. That was a bad day. We all have drama. We all have good days and bad days. But here's the point. What David wrote shows us his faith. That even when you have good days or bad days, that you can literally turn to God and God will lift you out of those doldrums. It doesn't mean that you won't ever be discouraged or depressed. It doesn't mean that you won't ever have bad days again. It simply means that we gain perspective when we have bad days. How do we turn a bad day into a good day. Well, I'm going to read from Psalm 103, just the first five verses. I won't read the entire chapter, but I want you to join me. You can either follow along on your phone, or if you have a a, a literal physical Bible, you can turn there to Psalm 103, or you can follow along on the screen. And here's what David wrote. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. You ever had a day you said, ain't that the pits? God says he'll deliver your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love, in other words, God's grace, He'll crown you with grace and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your new youth is renewed like the eagles. As I get older, I, I want more of that, my youth being renewed like the eagles. And this simply means that not only will he give you uh, days that are profitable and good uh, in your life as you continue on, but he will make your life effective, effective. Better to have an effective life than a long life that's not effective, wouldn't you say? Better to have a life that is meaningful than a life that is long and not very meaningful at all. And here's his point. He will extend your influence. He will extend your life. We all have days that are numbered, according to the Bible, it tells us that um, God has chosen our days. He knows exactly how long we're going to live. Now, uh, the Bible also does teach that we can extend that time, obviously, with the way you live, the choices you make, um, you know, you can extend your life. But what God is interested in is not necessarily just the quantity of the days of your life, but the quality of the days of your life. I want to show you three things from this text that we learn right from this text that will show us how to turn bad days into good days. Here's the first thing. Remember to bless the Lord. David said it, bless the Lord, O my soul. What in the world does that mean, to bless the Lord? The the word bless means to kneel down before the Lord in an act of worship. And so what David wrote that even when you're going through difficult times, we need to remember to worship God. We need to remember that in spite of how bleak our circumstances may be, in spite of how dark our day may be, we can always bless the Lord. We can always worship God and thank Him for His goodness. And and here's what we need to remember. There's more to life than just this life. In fact, if you look at what the Bible teaches about eternity, there's going to be a whole lot more after this life is over than there is during this life. So if the amount of your life, if the percentage of your life is more after this life, don't you think we should put some emphasis there? Don't you think we should think about that? So God tells us that we can learn to worship Him during our good days and bad days, Uh, We've got to learn to worship God. Now, here's the thing about worship that we see from this text. Number one, it's personal. In other words, it's not just enough to come to church. Now, don't get me wrong. You should come to church. We believe you should. 
But it's not just enough to go to church and say, boy, wasn't that music great? Boy, wasn't that sermon good? Boy, that pastor told that story and he said a funny joke. And boy, we really enjoyed the, the whole program. Our kids enjoyed themselves. There's more to it than that. I mean, that's important, don't get me wrong, but it must be personal. And, and you know, if you need a, a jump start being around others that will encourage you, you know, that's a biblical thing. One of the reasons we come to church is so that we are encouraged, we inspire each other, we encourage one another. Um, the Bible is very clear about that. So there's nothing wrong with coming to church and maybe you're feeling bad and maybe you're not quite up to snuff, so to speak. And uh, when you get in there, you see somebody and that encourages you, it spurs you on to worship. In fact, the word church means gathering, that's what it means. And so, what the Bible is clear about is it's personal. It's between you and God. And um, you can use your own personality in it. You don't have to have somebody else's personality. You don't have to pretend. You can just be real with you and God. In fact, if you read the Psalms, and I love the Psalms, do you know that David, who wrote most of the Psalms, he did a practice I call vertical venting. You know, you might as well let God know how you feel because he already knows anyway. You know, you ever thought, well, I can't say that to God because he might get angry at me. He already knows what you're thinking anyway. You might as well just get it out. And David, inevitably, in his discouraging times, he would do vertical venting. God, it seems like you've left me. God, why are the heavens uh, so close to me? Why does it seem like the heavens are brass? Lord, why does it seem like you've forgotten who I am? But he always came back after his feelings, expressing those feelings with his faith. He said, but God, I know you are sovereign. I know you're the Savior. I know that you are there for me. Worshiping God, it's personal. And then number two, you'll see this in this text. It's very passionate. For David, it was not just personal, but it was passionate. You got to pour your heart into worshiping God because when you do that you remember the blessings of the Lord you bless the Lord in other words you worship him and what that does for you is it helps turn a bad day into a good day I'm going to show you how that works in just a moment here's the second thing you got to learn to do you got to remember the blessings of the Lord not only remember to bless the Lord but remember the blessings of the Lord. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Anybody in here ever forget something? You ever forget your keys? Some, um, some people are worse than others. I have misplaced many things in my life, and the majority of the time, I always ask Kim where that is. Kim, where are my shoes? I don't know. I didn't wear them. All right? She'll say that to me. Kim, where is this? It's where we always put it. Where are the keys, Kim? It's hanging right here by the door. You know that. We've done this for 35 years. You ever forget stuff? The fact is we tend as human beings to forget things. Uh, maybe you don't forget your keys or where your shoes are or your, uh, your passcode or your password or whatever. Maybe you don't forget that. But you know what we do tend to forget? We tend to forget how good God has been to us. And so there is a practice that will help us to avoid growing cold in our relationship with God. Now, I got to say this. Everyone will have times in your life that you're hotter. I'm not talking about heat in your living room. I'm talking about hotter, more passionate in your relationship with God. There are going to be times when it feels like that you're going through the motions. You ever been there? We all go there. And so one of the things not to stay there is this spiritual discipline. And, and David shows us in this passage, we combat apathy by the spiritual disciplines of remembrance and meditation. I'm going to show you how that works. Remembering, we just did that with communion. Beautiful thing. Taking that disciplined approach, the spiritual discipline of remembering what God did for you. And then 
the spiritual discipline of meditation. Let, let me just say this. Um, what happens for us oftentimes is that we come and we equate praise with just simply singing a song. And that certainly is a part of worship. It's very important. But we often equate praising God with just thanking Him for things. Thank you, Lord, for my home. Thank you, Lord, for my house. Thank you, Lord, for my job. Thank you, Lord, for my family. Now, should you be thankful for that? Absolutely. The Bible is very clear about that. But there is a step further. If you want to practice a spiritual discipline that will help turn a bad day to a good day, you've got to learn that in praise, it all begins with and focuses on God. And so when I worship him and I remember his benefits, you know what I'm doing? I'm remembering what God has done in my life. I remember who he is. I remember Jesus. I remember salvation. You see, when you begin to think about not, when you compare the blessing of having a, a nice job or a house or food on the table to salvation, there is no comparison. And so what happens to us in our in our difficult times, when we have bad days, we tend not to focus on that. We focus on the circumstances. Boy, this sure is terrible traffic around here. Boy, I sure do hate getting stuck, uh, you know, trying to go uh, to, to shop for Christmas. Boy, I sure am upset that uh, with all the supply chain problems that I may not get my Christmas gifts until uh, after Christmas. And we, we begin to focus on our circumstances and we begin to complain a little bit. But when I remember the blessings of the Lord, bless the Lord on my soul, forget not, I'm remembering God. I'm remembering Jesus. I'm remembering salvation. I'm remembering what God has done for me. When I do that, you know what happens? I begin to turn bad days to good days. I dare you. Try to have a bad day when you think about how much God has forgiven you and loves you. Try to have a bad day when you start thinking about the gift of salvation. You can't do it. You know why? Because it is a spiritual discipline through meditation and remembrance. And you know, I, I think one of the key ways to do that, we just did this morning. It is through communion. Let me read from 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, verses 23 and 24, it says, for I received, this is the apostle Paul writing. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. We take bread because it represents the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's that spiritual discipline. That is that remembering. That is that practice of being thankful. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Do you see that? We're to remember what Jesus did. It is a spiritual discipline. It is meditation. It is focusing on the right thing. Now, always remember this, that when you're taking communion, it was what Jesus fulfilled. But it started, not communion, but Passover. Communion came from Passover. Passover was a picture of what Jesus Christ would do for us. If you don't know what Passover is, let me just kind of catch you up a little bit. Uh, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. God sent 10 plagues so that Pharaoh would let them go. He refused until the 10th plague. The 10th plague was the death of the firstborn. And God told Moses to tell the nation of Israel, he said, you need to kill an innocent lamb. That represents Jesus Christ who died on a cross for our sins. He was the lamb of God. And then it says, you're to take the blood of that lamb and put it on top of the doorpost and on both sides of the doorpost. Anybody see what that makes? That makes a cross. I believe the imagery there was important because it was pointing forward to the cross of Jesus Christ. And here's what God said. When I see the blood, the blood of the innocent lamb, I will pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes from. Now, you need to understand that what 
communion represents was that Jesus is the Lamb of God. He fulfilled Passover for us, and He wants us to remember what God has done for us. Now, when you go back to what God did for the Israelites, number one, He saved them. When you take communion, remember that God has saved you. Salvation is so important. But number two, he delivered them. You need to remember that God is a God who can deliver. Maybe you have a habit that you'd like to kick. God can deliver you from that. Maybe there's a sin you can't seem to overcome. God can deliver you from that. You see, it's a matter of faith. You read there in 1 Corinthians, I don't have time to do it, but you can read there about that, and it was an act of faith. When you take that, he says you're to do this to proclaim the Lord's death. In other words, this is an act of faith. And by faith, I get saved. By faith, I'm delivered from that which binds me. Do you know what else Jesus shows us and what God did for the Israelites in Passover uh, when they were delivered? He delivered them. He forgave them. He he gave them salvation, but he also supplied their need. You know what happened uh, when the Israelites uh, were delivered from Egypt? The Bible says that they spoiled the Egyptians. Now, that's an older translation. That doesn't mean that you spoil them like you spoil a little kid or that you leave out your Thanksgiving gravy and it spoils. That's not what that means. It means that it's like a spoil of war. They literally took all of their wealth. Now, what does that represent? God will provide for you. He is the provider. And we don't pray to take Uh, communion to say, God, make me rich. But what we do in faith is trust that God, we remember that he is the provider, that he is, you know what else he did? He healed them. The Bible says that they went for 40 years in the wilderness and none of these diseases came upon them. He healed them. He provided for them. It says that their clothes, their sandals never wore out. Can you imagine that? There were probably somewhere between one and a half and two and a half million Jewish people that were delivered and wandered around as whatever you would say, wanderers in the wilderness, and they lived in tents. Can you imagine what God had to do for them, to feed them, to give them water, to provide clothing for them? It's amazing. It's amazing. And the point is this. When I remember what God did, When I remember the blessings of the Lord, it helps me to stay warm in my relationship with God. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 12. Moses wrote this. He said, then take care, take care, lest you forget the Lord. Now, you say, well, I can't forget the Lord. The Israelites did. Oh, they didn't forget who he was, but they forgot what he did for them. They forgot their relationship. And you and I have the same tendency. He said, take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. What is the point? When I want to turn a bad day to a good day, I need to remember to bless the Lord. That's worship. I need to remember the blessings of the Lord. And then finally, I need to remember the benefits, the benefits of the Lord. And I want to just kind of read them out. This is not an exhaustive list, but we find it right here in this text that we just read what some of the benefits of being a believer are, what some of the benefits of having a relationship with God are. Here's what he says, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. What does he say there? Well, one of the benefits is forgiveness. Aren't you glad for the forgiveness of God? Oh, I'm so glad that he forgives. He's a God of second chances. He also provides healing. I believe that the Lord is the one who heals. Now, sometimes God uses modern medicine. Sometimes he uses doctors or healthcare workers, and I, we acknowledge that. But I do believe this. God heals every believer. He said, wait a minute, I had an aunt who was a Christian and she died of cancer. He didn't heal her. Yes, he did. Sometimes he heals us by taking us home. He heals every, ultimately, the majority of your existence, which is going to be throughout eternity, you are not going to have any disease. 
you're not going to have any pain. You're not going to have any sickness. You're not going to have to take any medication. Why? Because God is the one who heals. Thank God. Now, let me tell you, he also is the one who heals us. When God chooses to heal us, and I believe God does heal, and I believe through trusting him by faith, he will heal you. And I believe there are many people in our community that need to hear that message that God heals. But whenever he does that heal a believer, he has a greater plan in mind. And I've shared this with you many times. Uh, we have a sister-in-law, or had a sister-in-law. Her name was Lisa, and uh, she was married to my wife's oldest brother. She was a Christian, a strong Christian. And she got cancer. In fact, she got brain cancer. And she believed that God was going to heal her. She trusted. She claimed all these promises, and she died. Now, through the circumstances of her death, her husband came to Christ. And her three children came to Christ. And I can tell you this, God had a greater purpose in mind for her. And I can promise you that if Lisa had the choice, that if she knew that her death would bring her husband and her children to Christ, 100 times out of 100, she would have chosen what God chose for her. And and, and I want you to miss this, okay? He says that one of the benefits is he heals He not only heals physically, he heals broken spirit. He will heal your soul. He will heal you emotionally. He is greater than the mental health problems you may have or some relative may have. And and I don't want you to miss it. God heals. That's one of the benefits. Redemption, that's a benefit. Joy, that's a benefit. You can have joy. In fact, the Bible tells us that the angels announced that one of the reasons that Jesus came was to bring great joy to the earth. If you're a sad Christian or an angry Christian, well, there are a lot of those, aren't there? They're mad about everything. And I just sometimes want to ask, is there anything you're happy about? Anything you have actual joy about? Joy. He gives joy. Joy. That in spite of your circumstances, you can have joy. Joy is not based on, happiness is based on circumstances. If everybody behaves at Thanksgiving, if everybody compliments your cooking, that's happiness. Joy is even if you did not get to spend time with family like you want to, even if your adult children chose to go to somebody else's house rather than yours, you can have joy. Joy is based on your relationship with God. It's based on your understanding of who God is. Joy. Grace. He says he crowns us with uh, steadfast love and mercy. In other words, that is what your life will show. That's what you will be marked by, the grace of God. Are you marked by the grace of God? Are you marked by believing in his grace or are you marked by worry, stress, conflict? He says he gives us grace and mercy. He gives us satisfaction. Well, a lot of people have a lot of stuff, but they're not satisfied. You ever notice that? He says he'll give you satisfaction. You can be satisfied. Doesn't mean you don't have goals. Doesn't mean you don't want to improve. That's not what that means. But it means that wherever you are, you're content. You're content because God is with you. It gives you a renewal of purpose. It gives you renewal in your spirit, and it gives you a passion for living. I love that. He says he renews your youth like the eagles. Gives you a renewed passion. You know, my dad used to tell me, and I'm finding this is true, it's not the age, it's the mileage. You ever get there? If you're, if you're over 50 like I am, you're understanding that. It's not the age, it's the mileage. But you know what God can do for you, and I don't want you to miss this. No matter whether you're young or old, he can renew your passion. He can renew your passion for him and for living. 
My goodness, it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. You can be a teenager that some people associate with uh, wasted time in life and no goals, no purpose in life, and God will renew your youth. He'll give you purpose and vision and passion for living for Him. Or you can be 100 years old. While I was in North Carolina this week for Thanksgiving, my dad took me around. And I, I took on my phone pictures of my great, great, great grandparents' gravestone. I took my grandpa, a picture of my grandpa's gravestone, my great grandpa, my great great grandpa, my great 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 grandpa. You know, it was interesting because, you know, I found out that one of my great, great, great grandpa's actually was a pastor. And he started a church there where I grew up. And I began to think about that. You know, here are these men and women were that I never knew. I didn't know my grandpa and my grandparents and my great grandpa Miller. But my goodness, what a renewed passion. What a what a wonderful way to think about life and how good God has been to me. And I don't want you to miss this. He will renew your passion. Maybe you're retired, and he'll renew your passion for him. He may not renew your passion for going back to your old job. That's okay. But he'll renew your passion for living for him. Wherever you are, no matter what your age is, he promises to renew you if you'll bless him, if you'll worship him, if you remember his blessings to you. Let me, let me just give you the conclusion here. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. This is important. This is important. You want to turn bad days to good days? This is a key. You got to worship him. You got to remember his benefits. You got to remember that he is God. Remember his blessings in your life. But here's a key, a very important thing. Philippians 2, 14 and 15, do all things without grumbling or disputing. <laughs> Man, if that's all there was, that'd be enough, wouldn't it? Do all things. Are you a grumbler? Complainer? Man, we all tend to be, don't we? We grumble and complain, uh, you know. I mean, we grumble and complain about things that are really blessings in our life. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. In, notice this, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Would you say that describes the generation we live in? Man, calling good evil and evil good, twisted up, confused. He said, I want you to understand, if you'll do this without grumbling, without complaining, without disputing, if you'll remember me, if you'll worship me, if you'll remember my benefits, notice what he said, among whom you shine as lights in the world. You'll stand out. You'll be a light for him. But you got to learn to say thank you. You got to learn to bless him. You got to remember how much he's blessed you. You got to remember his benefits. And when you do that, you can always turn bad days to good. And I hope you'll be able to do that as well. Those of you online, I hope you'll remember this, practice this, practice the spiritual discipline of turning bad days into good days by meditating and remembering what he's done for us. Heavenly Father, help us to be thankful this Thanksgiving weekend. Help us to remember all you've done. My, you're so good. Help us to remember our relationship with you. God, I pray that you bless us today. And help us to bless you. In Jesus' name. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.